Um, thank you. Thank you, Brother Terrence. Um, let me... Uh, it seems there is no audio. Let me again, again say happy Sabbath, brothers and sisters, and apologize for the lack of audio at the beginning. Um, as I said, when you were not hearing me, that last week we started a series in the book of Daniel, and I gave an overall introduction to the book of Daniel. This week we're going to get into Daniel chapter 1, but I'm still going to give you an introduction to, to the nation of Israel and their purpose for you to fully understand the context that Daniel and his friends found themselves in. All right? Um, thank you for joining. And again, in the link for this video, I posted the website for those of us who are not Seminary Adventists for you to go and find the lesson study guide that you can use to follow and uh, um, we can study along all right now the topic um, tonight is really a long topic I am in Bali I am in Babylon but Babylon not in me we're studying Daniel chapter 1 now the conflict that we're in on this earth is about God's sovereignty that is about God's sovereignty. That's Lucifer challenged God's authority, God's right to rule and to tell us what to do, God's ways in terms of the, the, his modus operandi, whether or not it is the best way. You know, those are some of the issues involved in, the, in, the, in this um, challenge. Um, Lucifer insinuated that God is unjust and his laws are unreasonable. And we are better off following our own ways because we are intelligent enough to know what to do. Now, in responding to this challenge, God has to operate by his rules. He has to operate by his principles of love. And because he's not dealing with static objects, such as trees and plants, and, he, and he's dealing with people who have freedom of choice. It complicates how God remove sin and remove rebellion. You know, we, if we have a problem with insects, we can get a spray and just spray all the insects and they die and that's it. We are good. But in this case, God is dealing with people whom he love and they have freedom of choice. So that complicates the matter. Now, God's response, therefore, is based on love, righteousness, and not a mere demonstration of his supremacy, but a demonstration of his kindness and compassion. And that ultimately came through the incarnation of Jesus Christ. All of God was, was invested and revealed in the person of Jesus Christ. Now, before we get there... Um, before Christ came into this world, God called Abraham, and that's a cut his long story. You know the story already. Basically, he called him out of Babylon, by the way. He called him out of Babylon to say, Come and I'm going to bless you and make of you a great nation. And Abraham took a journey of faith that brought him into the land of Canaan. And he, the same promise was given to Isaac and to Jacob. And eventually in Exodus chapter 19, verses 46, the same covenant was made with, with the nation of Israel as they came out of Egypt. Here's a simple agreement. If you obey me, I'm going to bless you because um, all the earth is mine. So in the end, Israel was called to accomplish one purpose that's to glorify God and to usher in the, the Messiah. So at Mount Sinai, when God made this covenant with Israel and gave them his laws and his statutes and his judgments and his sanctuary and his instructions and his promise, what really happened is that we have a nation that was established we have a nation that was established that was now god's representative on earth let me see if i can bring it on the screen to make the point here is a nation whose constitution 
is the same constitution that governs heaven. And that is the Ten Commandments that, and is, that is expounded on, in the books of Exodus, Leviticus, and so on. Here is a nation whose God is the same God who is in heaven. Here is a nation whose success is not dependent on their connection with other powerful nations. Their success is dependent on their connection with God. A nation who is sustained by God. That is, that is the experiment that God did with Israel. A nation who is sustained by the God of heaven. And finally, a nation whose presence is an affront to Satan's claims. Right? And that's why Satan hated the children of Israel so much. You know, in, in examples are found in the in the experience of, of Balaam when and Balak when when um, Balak paid Balaam to, to curse Israel, but every time he tried to curse them, he realized that God was shielding them and protecting them. Because this is God's people. This is God's experiment on earth. This is God's demonstration of his love and power and his wisdom. Israel as a nation was called to demonstrate that. And so Israel's success was not going to be based on their military strategy or the wealth of their kings or their connection with mightier nations. Their success will be based on their connection with God. Because in the end, God alone must get the glory. And so to study the, the, the history of, of Israel is to study an interesting um, experiment. When you read the books of Judges, 1st and 2nd Samuels, 1st and 2nd Kings, 1st and 2nd Chronicles, you're reading the history of a nation who struggled to keep God as their God, who struggled with the concept of whether or not it will work to have God as their supreme ruler. And a nation, an experiment where God struggled to see if his people will trust in him enough for him to prove his glory. That's what the history of Israel is all about. And, and you know the story, I won't have to go through it, that after they came into the, 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 the land of Canaan with Joshua as their leader, uh, we had some good leaders there, but after a while the people rebelled, got punishment, then they repent and they get back and so on. And then they eventually asked for a king. God gave them a king in the person of Saul. Saul failed. God gave them David. David became the iconic king of Israel who represented what all of what God um, wanted. And then Solomon came. Solomon was a bit, he was the wisest king, but he gave in to temptation and rebelled against God. And um, eventually the kingdom was divided on the real womb between the northern kingdom of Israel and the southern kingdom of Judah, which was 10 tribes um, as opposed to the tribe of Judah. And by the way, the tribe of Judah included persons from other tribes. It's just that Judah was the most dominant tribe. So for example, you had the Levi, some of the Levites, the Benjamites, and so on, who were a part of the, um, the Jews. Now, eventually, um, Israel as a nation, the, the, the northern kingdom of Israel was exiled in 722 BC because of disobedience. Um, all the kings who ruled Israel, they followed in the example of Jeroboam and were punished. So that left us with Judah, the king, or the Jews. And eventually, because of disobedience, God gave Judah captive into the hands of Nebuchadnezzar. And that's how the book of Daniel started out, by the way. The first two chapters of the book of Daniel says that God gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into the hands of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon. That's how Daniel started out. And that's where we are. 
um, at this time. We're going to pick up from there. So here it is that we have a situation where Judah, the kingdom of God, is overcome by a nation, right? Um, there you have it. There the first chapter I did quote it um, directly, but it says Daniel chapter one and verse and verse one and two. In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. And the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hands with some of the vessels of the house of God. And he brought them to the land of Shinar, to the house of his God, common G, and placed the vessels in the treasury of his God. So here you have a situation where opposite to the nation of Israel whose God is the God of heaven. We have Babylon conquering Judah and Babylon represent many things. Eventually Babylon becomes the symbol of rebellion against God and um, you're going to see why. Because here it is that we have a nation that is in rebellion against God, the God of heaven. Babylon's victory over Judah was celebrated as a victory by Murdoch over the God of Judah. Right? And Babylon became a symbol of rebellion against God. And you'll see that in the book of, of Jeremiah, Isaiah, and even the book of Revelation. And that is important that you're going to see why as we go along. Now, so you're going to, you see a situation where um, though literal Babylon was eventually destroyed, as I said, in the book of Revelation, it becomes a symbol of opposition against God. So, Daniel and his friends, at a very young age, were taken to Babylon. Daniel was about 17 to 18 years old. He was a teenager. These were young men whose parents taught them to revere the God of heaven only. These were young men whose parents taught them that only God or the God of heaven they should worship. But like Joseph, they found themselves in a land who had little or no knowledge of the God that they serve or any regard for the God of heaven. As a matter of fact, the idea was that their captivity was a demonstration that their God was powerless, you know, and couldn't help them. Because as customary, um, any victory for a nation back then was also a victory for their God, for that God becoming the dominant God. And so now as customary, um, the conquering king was going to make use of these captives by employing them in his service. You know, it don't make sense to kill them if they're intelligent and, and he, they, can, they can build up his kingdom. Then he's going to um, do that. And so the, the plan was to put them on a program that would convert them, really, to Babylonianism. In other words, when 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 he, when, he, when they when they go through this program, it's a three-year program. He can qualify for a, for a bachelor's degree degree program in our context. Um, that program was to integrate these men who were from this conquered nation, a nation who doesn't exist anymore, who has been dissolved. So 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 Nebuchadnezzar expected that these young men their loyalty to their God, their loyalty to their people should be just as dissolved. And so the Bible tells us in Daniel chapter 1, verse 3 to 4, Then the king instructed Ashpenaz, the, the master of his eunuchs, to bring some of the children of Israel and some of the king's descendants and some of the nobles and young men in whom there was no blemish, but good-looking, gifted in all wisdom, knowledge and quick to understand who had ability to serve in the king's palace and whom they might teach the literature 
of the Chaldees. That was part of what the training program was. Right? It was not only, as I said before, to prepare them to stand in the king's palace. But the idea is that um, when he's done with them, they, you could not tell that they were not Babylonians. That was the purpose that Nebuchadnezzar um, had in his mind when he put them on this program. So included in this program was that he changed their names to represent Babylonian gods. Um, originally, their names were um, Bel Hananiah, Mishael, and Hazariah, and Belteshazzar. Peltazajar, I'm sorry for the pronunciation, but the idea was that these original names, right? Daniel, for example, meant God is my judge, represented the God of heaven. But Nebuchadnezzar said, no, your God don't have any impact anymore. And so he gave them names, Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, which represents the gods of Babylon. All right? Secondly, he taught them new languages. No longer should you teach, no longer should you speak in the languages of, of your older nation because that's, that's disintegrated. No, it no longer exists. He taught them the language of Babylon. And I think Akkadian was the main language and they had some other languages that they use in, in, in scholarship and in worship. They taught them those languages. Then besides that, he taught them the science and mathematics of Babylon. Right? Um, Babylon was, was very good for mathematics. They are the ones who came up with the um, sexadecimal system, which means the 60. Um, counting by 60. If you notice, our times are counted by 60. We have 60 seconds in a minute, 60 minutes in an hour. That's coming from Babylon. They, they were very advanced scientifically and mathematically. And finally, they prescribed a special diet for these young men. So this was a very special program. Even though Daniel and his friends were, were slaves, they got the high privilege of being nurtured from the king's table and from and from the king's training program. It was a really, um, it was a scholarship <laughs> that they got, a scholarship that would make will change their lives forever. And so, what this tells me, brothers and sisters, is that Babylon had standards. You know, Babylon has a goal to accomplish and standards to support those goals, right? The world, if, if you want to use Babylon in this case as an application um, to represent the world, you find that the world has standards, right? The world does have standards. Happy Sabbath, Patrice. Happy Sabbath, everyone who are on at this time. The world does have standards. And um, in order for you to become a part of the world, you need to drop your standards that you held as a Christian to take on the worldly standards. Because I can tell you this, the world will not drop its standard to accommodate you. You have to drop your standards to accommodate the world. As the Bible says in James chapter 4, verse 4, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. For if any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. And 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 First John chapter two says, "Love not the world." Oh, I'm sorry, I'm I'm quoting. I was just quoting First John for James. James says, "Friendship with the world is enmity with God." Right? We are in the world, but we are not. Of the world and that's why Daniel had that mindset Daniel recognized that listen I am in Babylon 
but that doesn't mean Babylon must be in me. And so Daniel, let me try and bring this on the screen so I can I can show it to you again about what, what, what Daniel and his friends did. Daniel says, it's like Bible says, Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with a portion of the king's meat, nor of the wine which he drank. And so he, he made a request of the, of the eunuch to have something else. In other words, Daniel did not mind having his name changed. Right? Daniel did not mind learning the science of Babylon. He didn't mind going to their schools. He didn't mind learning their language. But he would not drink and eat like Babylonians. That's the essence of it. And though it is that it, 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 it comes out of eating and drinking, but if you make the general application, what Daniel was saying, I might be in Babylon, but Babylon is not in me. I might, you might see me in Babylon, but I'm still a child of the king. I might be in Babylon, but I do not recognize Murdoch as the true God. I am still the servant of the God of heaven. Even though the nation of Israel, whose God is supposed to be the Lord, I know that it is God who gave us into the hands of Nebuchadnezzar. I know it is not Murdoch who conquered Judah. It is the God of heaven who removed his protection because Israel and Jews, Judah disobeyed. And so Daniel still says, I recognize only one authority. I recognize the authority of the God of heaven. And so he says he purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with a portion of the king's meat. Now there are several reasons why Daniel did not accept the king's meat. Um, and I'm just going to present two of them. The, the, the key thing to remember is that Daniel says he will not defile himself. So whatever, whatever it is, Daniel felt that eating the king's meat and drinking the wine would be wrong. And we can only assume or, or insinuate based on scripture what it is that caused Daniel to take such a firm stand. Right? The first thing is that the king's meat might have included unclean foods. Based on Leviticus chapter 11 and Deuteronomy 14 that God had explained to, to Moses and to Aaron exactly the type of meat that were fit for consumption. We won't have time to go into details into that, but it would be good for you to read it on your own. Um, these principles still apply today. Daniel would not defile himself with unclean meats. And secondly, it is possible that the king's food was first offered to idols. That was a general practice. Um, partaking of the meal would signify partaking of idolatry. According to Acts chapter 15, verse 28, part of the stipulation that the apostles gave to the newly converted Gentiles was that it says, for it seemed good to the Holy Ghost and to us to lay upon you no greater burden than these necess necessary things, that you abstain from meats offered to idols. So it was a stipulation that um, eating meat offered to idols could mean idolatry. All right? So Daniel was saying, listen, I still belong to God. Many of us would say to Daniel, listen, man, you, 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 you are so blessed. You're getting so much privilege. You're getting so much opportunity. Why are, you going, why are you going to blow this scholarship? Why are you going to blow this chance of, of getting ahead in the world and of becoming prominent in Babylon, the greatest empire on the earth? You're getting the privilege of standing in the king's palace. Why not just ease yourself and let things glide? Because you're really... Um, are you going to really kick over... 
such glorious opportunity for a plate of meat just eat the food man for, for, for three years and then you can change that's the argument that many are giving today to justify their worthiness despite their claim to be a Christian but Daniel and his friends would prove what God could not accomplish through a nation God would accomplish through a few good men and so if you recognize what the book of Daniel is about recognize what the book of Daniel is about let me bring it on the screen so I can tell you so I can I can explain to you a little better the rest of the, the, the book of Daniel is about God that God's way is the best way Daniel 1 proves that God's diet is the best diet because if you notice when Daniel and his friends were through the other guys and something tell me that the other guys also included some other Jews <laughs> who were not named but they were not named among the worthies because they compromised their faith it tells me that God's diet is the best and Daniel and his friends who chose God's way were proven fairer and fatter and wiser than all the wise men of Babylon. Secondly, Daniel 2 tells us that God is the one who reveals secrets. The king of Babylon could not understand the dream until Daniel tell him what it was. Daniel chapter 3 tells us that God has power over the elements of nature, including fire. What God could not accomplish through a whole nation, he accomplished through few men who were willing to obey him and to cost them what it may. Daniel chapter 4, brothers and sisters, tells us, that if the, great, if the king of the greatest empire will not acknowledge him, he will humble him so he go and eat grass for seven years until he lift up his eyes to heaven and acknowledge that the God of heaven is a true ruler. Daniel chapter 5 tells us that he is to be respected and honored by all, including the king. And Daniel chapter 6 tells us that he can shut the lion's mouth. And I'm, this is so amazing because here it is. This is a situation where a whole nation failed to honor the God of heaven. Jews, the, the Judah, Judah became so much ashamed of their God. That they would not obey him but in Babylon four young men decided that the God of heaven is truly sovereign and God used them to demonstrate his power and his authority God used them to bring powerful nation to their knees Daniel was so respected by not only Nebuchadnezzar and, 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 the, uh, and, his, and his successors but when me the Persian Empire took over Daniel was still highly respected and God demonstrated in the experience of me the Persia that he is a true and living God my brother and sisters this tells me that we have no excuse for conforming to the world this tells me that we might be in the world but we don't need to be off the world we don't need to be pressured we, need, we don't need to give in to the pressure of worthiness romans chapter 12 verse 1 to 2 says be not conformed to this world but be transformed by the renewing of your mind i will close this study by going back to how it started the conflict that we are in is about God's sovereignty the conflict that we're in 
is about whether or not the God of heaven is capable of doing what he says. The conflict that we're in is about whether or not the, the, the standards and principles of God are the right ones, are the better ones. And God proved that through Daniel and his friends. The question is, can he find some Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego today? If God needs a witness of his power, if he needs a witness of his wisdom and compassion and love, can he find it in you? That's the question we want to ask tonight. And I tell you this before I close, that the same experiences that Daniel and his friends went through, God's people in the time of the end who mostly benefit from the writings of Daniel will need the fate of Daniel too. They will need the diet of Daniel. They will need the prayer life of Daniel. They will need the Bible study habits of Daniel. And they will need the faith of Daniel. Because the time is coming when, like Daniel, their religious liberty will be taken away. And it will be, the question will be asked, do you believe that God of heaven can deliver? But I promise you this, that if you live like Daniel, and if, the, and if Daniel's God is your God, the same God who shut the lion's mouth can deliver you also if you stand for him. Amen? So tonight I want to encourage you to make Daniel's God your God too. And we are going to be continuing our journey in the book of Daniel next week as we study Daniel chapter 2. Please make sure to get a study guide that's provided in the link and follow us on this journey as we study the book of Daniel. Jesus, as I mentioned last week, encouraged us to study the book of Daniel and to understand it. And especially we were living in these last days. We need the wisdom and the encouragement of Daniel, Daniel's God. Amen? If there are no questions, <laughs> yes, Marian, it's final exam. Um, if there are no questions right now, I'm, I'm looking through and I'm not seeing any question. I guess it's very clear. Um, we will close with prayer tonight. And if you have any prayer requests, you can post it there. We want to pray. You know, I have confidence in young people. You know, I'm not, I'm, I'm not one of those who join the Bhagwangan to, 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 to bash young people. I believe that young people can have faith too. And so I want to pray that we'll have more young people, more youth, who, like Daniel and his friends, will stand up for God and, will, and, 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 and prove that God, God Daniel's God, is the ultimate God who deserves our worship. Amen. Happy Sabbath, Ayoka. I see your request. We're going to pray at this time. Father, we thank you for your word. Thank you for your willingness, Lord, to work with those who put their trust and faith in you. You work with Daniel and you'll work with anyone who trusts in you. I pray for each person who is watching at this time and who might be, who will be watching this video even after it is done we pray that the holy spirit will fill them lord bless them and give them the courage that where they are they will by their life lifestyle their habits demonstrate that the god of heaven is a true and living god bless us as we continue to study your words we pray in jesus name amen thank you again for joining i appreciate your support and god bless you and your family richly.